Good afternoon, everyone. We are so excited that you're here with us today. My name is Janelle, and we're really excited to be here um, talking all about pollinators. As you can see, I'm here in the Meadowway, which is a really cool place. And we're going to talk a little bit more about um, in uh, Scarborough in the east end of Toronto. It's a long meadow uh, that used to be just grass, but now there's wildflowers here, which makes it the perfect place to talk all about pollinators. But before we get into that, a couple things I wanted to mention. There is a uh, worksheet that you can do along with this, uh, with this live stream. So teachers, if you haven't signed up for that worksheet, um, and it looks like this. Thank you, Cheryl's on the back end helping. So thank you, Cheryl um, and Raya. But yeah, that's the worksheet. And if you want it, you can uh, click the link that is in the chat so that you can access that, uh, that worksheet for your students and for your classes. The other thing I want to mention is we hope that you can interact with us today. So please put any questions or comments that your students have um, in the chat so that we can see them and interact with them. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be a great time. So as I mentioned, we are here in this beautiful meadow um, and it doesn't look like much right now, but there's actually a lot going on. And I'm just going to move a little bit over here so we can hear me a little better. But we can also see some other things as well. So in this meadow, there are lots of flowers and lots of plants um, and lots of life. And when we're thinking about pollinators, the first thing we have to think about is the flowers and the plants that are around. So plants, all the plants in this meadow, all the plants in this natural space, their job as a plant is to make more plants. And in order to do that, they need to make seeds. A lot of flowers, in order to make seeds, they need to be pollinated. So what is pollination? Let's start there. What's pollination? So has anyone ever touched the inside of a dandelion and you rubbed your finger on the inside of a dandelion, the middle of the dandelion, and you got like this yellow powdery stuff on your fingers. Or maybe you smelled a rose or a daisy and you stuck your nose in there and you got a little bit of yellow powder on your nose. So that's pollen. All of that powdery stuff is pollen. And pollen, when it moves from one flower of the same species to another flower of the same species, that flower that got pollinated, that has that pollen added to it, that flower can now make seeds. And those seeds, as we know, can grow into more and more plants. So let's take a look um, at how that could happen. So some plants, they use wind to do that because as we know, flowers can't move, right? So how do they get pollen from one plant to another? Some use wind, some use water but a lot of flowers will use what? pollinators. And pollinators are animals, all sorts of different types of animals you're gonna get into, but they're animals that help move pollen from one flower to the next. So let's, I'm gonna show you what that may look like. And I'm going to show you that using these flowers. So imagine this is a lovely meadow, just like the one that I'm in, in the meadow. I'm, all these flowers are growing and happy in the sun and with water. And along comes, they know that they need to make seeds. So along comes a bee. And this bee wants to get delicious, nutritious, sweet, yummy nectar that all of these flowers are providing inside the middle of their flower. Now remember, inside the middle of the flower, that's where the pollen is as well. So as this, this bee visits this flower, drinking up all its sweet, nutritious nectar, it also, on all of the hairs on its body, picks up some pollen. And those little powdery pollens, just like if we smell a flower, that pollen gets on our nose, it gets all over the bee. And as the bee heads from flower to flower, drinking up nectar, that pollen moves with it. Now, if this bee just visited the pink flower and then the blue flower and stopped there, there would be no pollination. Remember, pollination needs to happen between flowers of the same type. So between the pink and the blue, those aren't same. They're different colors, right? They're different plants. So no pollination happens, even though this bee has pollen on it. But if the bee visits the pink flower and then the blue flower, maybe, 
and then the another pink flower this bee already has pollen on it from that first pink flower that pollen is now deposited on this new pink flower and this flower can make seeds and grow more and more plants and that's really important and we're going to be talking about that in a little bit so we'll maybe start thinking about why is it important that we have all these plants that pollinators are able to pollinate plants so that is what pollination is, the movement of pollen from flower to flower. And a lot of the time our pollinators, they don't really think that they're pollinating. They're just looking for food. So they'll be looking for food in the source of nectar, sometimes in other bugs, or sometimes they'll even eat the pollen itself. But they're not doing it on purpose, but they're a very useful tool that flowers use in order to pollinate and make more seeds. So let's take a look at some of our pollinators and what they may look like. Most of the pollinators we think about when we think of pollinators, let's think about pollinators. What are we thinking about? Often we're thinking about a bee, just like the bee I just showed you. So our bees are an amazing uh, pollinator. They have hairs all over them to attract all of that pollen that they move from flower to flower. There are 400 different types of bees just in Ontario, which is really, our, which is really great and amazing. And we're gonna be talking a little bit more about the diversity of bees. But there's also another pollinator that we usually think of, and those are our butterflies, which are beautiful um, insects as well. Another type of pollinator are hummingbirds. So when we think of pollinators, a lot of the time we think of bees and butterflies, those are insects. But remember, I said pollinators can be any animal that helps pollinate flowers. So of course they could be insects, but they can be birds as well, like our ruby-throated hummingbird, which is the only hummingbird that we have in Ontario. Now there are some other pollinators that we may not always think of. Flies, for example. Flies are really important pollinators for plants that are maybe smelly and smell like rotting things or old meat because flies love that thing. So those flowers smell a certain way to attract those flies. And when it attracts those flies, those flies will pollinate that flower. Beetles as well may, attra may be attracted to things that smell really bad um, or smell maybe like fungus or um, other things like that as well. So they'll get all of that pollen on their body as they move around. Wasps are ones that we may not necessarily think of pollinators. And, you know, we think bees are pollinators, but wasps, they're just annoying. But they're not. They do a lot of really important things in our ecosystems and in our habitats. When wasps visit flowers, they're usually looking for another bug to eat, often. So they may be looking for aphids or something that is inside the flower. But as they do that, they're also pollinating the flower, which is really cool to think about. And there are some other pollinators that we usually don't think about at all, but moths. So the nighttime cousins of butterflies are really important butterfly are really important pollinators as well. Sometimes moths will fly during the day, like our sphinx moth in this picture. This moth also sort of looks like a hummingbird, doesn't it? So those moths will fly around during the daytime and pollinate. But a lot of moths will pollinate during the nighttime while their flowers are still out and maybe there's not as many things around trying to eat them or hurt them. Ants as well are important pollinators. And bats, which are not an insect and not a bird, but a mammal, which is cool. Bats pollinate things. Now, I will say, in Ontario, we don't have any bats that pollinate. All of all the bats that we have here in Ontario will eat bugs and insects as they fly around during the night. But in different places in the world, bats are essential pollinators and some plants are only pollinated by bats, which is really cool to think about. So we're going to take a look at some of our plants in just a little bit, but I did want to give more information about two of the pollinators that we just looked at. And the first one are bees, because we usually think about bees when we're thinking about pollinators. And there are so many types of bees, although we're usually also thinking about honeybees. You know honeybees? Honeybees make honey. And when they visit flowers, they suck up that nectar, they bring it back to their hives, which have thousands of bees, and they spit that nectar into one of those honeycombs, which have six sides, like a hexagon. 
And when they spit that nectar in there, they fan it with their wings and that process makes honey. And that honey is food for the bees, but we also eat honey and other animals will eat honey as well as they harvest it from the beehives. But bees aren't our only pollinators around here. Bees originated in Europe. So before Europeans came to Canada, there were no honeybees, or sorry, the honeybees um, originated in Europe. So before people came from Europe to these lands, there are no honeybees over here. So there had to be something else pollinating all the plants that we have around us. And in fact, there are tons of bees that help us do that. So we have bumblebees, which are those thick sort of chubby, fluffy bees that will fly and bumble from flower to flower. We also have a lot of native solitary bees. And when I say solitary, I mean that they don't live in big, huge hives like our honeybees or even smaller hives like our, our bumblebees. They'll often live all by themselves. And those bees come in all sorts of different colors. Or if you could just go back one slide for a second. So we have green bees sometimes like our egg, Agapostamon, uh, which is that bee there in the on that pink background. And that is, if you're in Toronto and you're watching, that's actually your official bee of Toronto, which is really cool. They are ground nesters, so they'll live inside the ground, underneath the ground. We have mason bees, which is that middle picture, and they will harvest mud in order to make their homes. And we also have leaf cutter bees, which will live by themselves, and they'll cut leaves in order to make their homes as well. So if we look on the next slide, you can see an example of what these homes may look like. They find cavities, so little holes all around nature, but sometimes humans can make these homes as well. Um, and they will fill up these cavities with some pollen, so they collect lots and lots and lots of pollen, and an egg, and then they'll make little homes for that pile of pollen and eggs, and they'll make little chambers with either mud or leaves or whatever material they're using, and they'll make those homes all along their little cavity until they make it to the end and they close it off. So if you look in this picture, you can see some of these holes are filled with leaves, some of them are filled with mud and they're sort of random all over the place. So lots of different bees are using the space as a home. Now bees love a lot of different types of flowers, but did you know that bees have favorite colors? Can you guess what maybe the favorite colors of bees are? Just like how we have favorite colors, my favorite color is green. Bees love purples and blues and yellows and whites, those are their favorite colors. So if you find a flower that is purple or blue or yellow or white, you can probably guess that a bee will love to pollinate that, that flower. So in this picture, we see blue vervain up at the top with our bumblebee on it. Black-eyed Susans, these beautiful yellow flowers are also a favorite for bees, all sorts of bees. Sometimes bees are specialists, which means that they'll only pollinate and only collect the nectar and pollen from a certain type of, of uh, flower. So this bottom picture, this yellow flower, is a squash plant. Is anyone growing squash? Or at least does anyone eat squash? So squash needs to be pollinated by squash bees, and bees, uh, squash bees need to pollinate squash. So Without that bee, we wouldn't have a lot, a lot of the squash that we eat around today. So they're a very important specialist bee. Some bees will also pollinate things like tomatoes using what we call buzz pollination. And so they'll hang onto the flower and they'll buzz their wings at a certain frequency. And that buzz vibrates the pollen out of that flower onto their fur, on their, to their fur, their hairs that they have on their bodies. Bees can also, I mentioned their favorite colors are blues and yellows and whites and purples, but they can also see a color that we can't see. And that color is ultraviolet. And oftentimes these flowers that are purples and blues and yellows and whites, they will have secret messaging on them that we can't see, but bees can see. So this bottom picture, you can see um, one half of the picture is a yellow flower. And the other half of the picture is that same flower, but as a bee would see it. So you can see all the way around the outside are these white looking petals. And on the inside is a darker color. And that acts as like a bullseye, a target. So the bee knows exactly where to land to get the most nectar and pollen.
isn't that amazing that they can see all these things that we can't see? There's an entire hidden world in these meadows and in these forests that we're around. All right, that's a lot about bees. I'm gonna tell you one more thing, or I'm gonna tell you another pollinator that we wanna look at today. And those are our butterflies, our beautiful butterflies. A lot of people love butterflies because they come in all sorts of different colors and shapes and they flutter around so beautifully. Most of us may know this top one that's orange and black. Does anyone know what the name of that butterfly is? I'll give you a minute to answer this one. Maybe this one can be one that you can pop in the chat. What is the name of this orange and black and white butterfly? Hmm. I often see them early in, coming into the spring and I see a lot of them in the fall as well. And they're all sort of moving in the same direction because they migrate. In fact, these butterflies migrate and move from Canada all the way down to Mexico every year, which is an amazing journey. Did you guess that this is the monarch butterfly? Yeah, so this is a monarch butterfly and they're an amazing, beautiful butterfly that we have here. But we also have butterflies like our yellow swallowtail, which is right beside the, the monarch there. Another big butterfly, well, not that big, about this big, big butterfly that we can see in these meadows and in our yards and around our schools. And we also have some smaller butterflies that you'll often see around our yards and schools and meadows as well. And the fun thing about our, our smaller butterflies is they're often named by their color. So at the bottom, we have a white butterfly and this category of butterflies are called whites. So the whites, this one is a cabbage white butterfly, but there are some other white butterflies uh, as they're named. The yellow one is a sulfur butterfly. So sulfur is yellow. So sulfur butterflies, uh, there's a few different kinds of sulfur butterflies like the clouded sulfur. And our last one is a blue. So we have our white, our sulfur, and our blues. And this one in particular is a Carner blue butterfly, which is actually, it used to be all over um, Ontario, but it's now extirpated or what we call extinct. We can no longer find it in Ontario because of habitat loss. So they don't have the flowers that they need in order to drink from, in order to live on anymore, which is kind of sad. But let's go to a happier note because I remember how I mentioned bees love a certain color. They have favorite colors. Now butterflies, they also like certain plants. And although they like pinks and reds and purples and oranges, they are more general with their colors. Instead, they like certain plants by their shape. So they'll love flowers that are flat and have a nice landing pad like our Coreopsis, which is that yellow flower on the bottom, or purple cone flower, which is up at the top. Or they'll like flowers that have bunches, uh, like our milkweed up at the top, or our joy pie weed down at the bottom. So they can hang on to those bunches really well as they drink all the nectar up from those flowers. Now, flowers aren't only important for butterflies for feeding and for finding food, but plants are actually really important for butterflies in all stages of their life cycle. And does anyone know how butterflies start off? What's the first part of their life cycle? How do they start off? They're not always butterflies. They start off as something smaller. Hmm. And we can see on the screen came up, they start off as an egg. So a little tiny egg will be laid on a leaf. And in the case of this, we are going to be thinking about our monarch butterfly because monarchs are super cool because they only use milkweed plants, which they also pollinate, but they only use milkweed plants to lay their eggs on. It's the only plant that their caterpillars can eat. So a monarch will fly around and lay an egg on a monarch leaf. And as that egg develops into a, um, into a getting ready to hatch, it will turn into the next part of the life cycle, which is a caterpillar. And our monarch caterpillar, and I have a little, a little example of one here, a little toy. Our monarch caterpillar's job is to just eat and poop. That's all they do all day because they need to grow a lot. It would be the same as if you, as a child, just ate and ate and ate for a few weeks and you grew the size of a school bus. 
that's how much they grow in the time that they're eating, which is really amazing. So as they finish eating up um, all the leaves that they can eat, they crawl underneath a leaf, they hang upside down, and they form this. Does anyone know what this is called? Hmm. This is called a chrysalis. And this chrysalis, in particular this one, is how monarchs got their name. Because if you look really closely on the monarch chrysalis, it has a crown of gold around the top, just like a monarch would or a royalty would have a crown, which is kind of cool. Now in that chrysalis, the caterpillar is taking itself apart cell by cell until it's a bag of mush, and then it puts itself back together. And when it puts itself back together, it is in the shape of a butterfly. And that butterfly will emerge from the chrysalis and find another leaf to lay eggs on, another milkweed leaf, and the cycle starts all over again. So we've been sitting for a while. I've been talking for a while. I think it's time to move our bodies a little bit. And maybe we'll move our bodies to that life cycle that we just mentioned. So everyone, you can stand up where you are make sure you have room to move around not too much room we're just gonna we don't need to run around just right where you are and we're gonna be going for a walk in just a little bit so i like to stretch before we do a walk so let's do a life cycle stretch a metamorphosis stretch so that life cycle that the the monarchs go through is called metamorphosis and lots of different bugs go through metamorphosis so let's do our monarch metamorphosis stretch and we'll start at the beginning. And what do we all start off as? Hmm. We all start off as an egg. So for an egg, I want everyone who is standing to crunch your body really, really small into a nice, tight little egg that you would find on a leaf. And in that egg, oh, squish yourself really, really tight because it's so, 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 so tiny. After a while, that egg will hatch into a caterpillar. So I want you to wiggle up like you are a caterpillar. And I want you to stretch out your little caterpillar legs. And as a caterpillar, you move around your leaves and wiggle around your leaves and eat up all your leaves. And you eat and you eat and you eat until you're so, so, so full that you find another leaf to hang underneath and you turn into what? chrysalis so i want you to stretch up high like you were a chrysalis point your fingers like you're the top of a chrysalis stretch 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 you are a lovely chrysalis hanging and swaying in the wind as you develop into a beautiful what comes after our chrysalis butterfly so stretch out your wings butterfly you have made it all the way to the end of your life cycle, but it is a cycle. So as you fly around butterflies, I want you to look for delicious, nutritious milkweed plant. And as you find that milkweed plant, you are going to lay an egg on it. And we're gonna start that life cycle one more time. So let's all be a nice, tight, 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 little, little egg on the bottom of the leaf. You are so tight and tiny, but eventually you hatch into a caterpillar and you stretch out your little caterpillar legs and you move around your leaves you eat them all up but eventually you get full and you're going to find another twig to lay under and you turn into a chrysalis so stretch up high as a chrysalis stretch 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 because inside that chrysalis you're doing big work turning yourself from a caterpillar into I hope you're flapping your arms like a butterfly. Actually, they sort of flap like this. So you can flap like this, or you can flap like this. But I hope you're flapping your arms like a butterfly because we've made it to our butterfly stage. And as our monarchs, we are going to say we're in the fall and we're going to flap all the way down to Mexico. Oh, my arms are tired, but we've made it. Thank you, everyone, for stretching with me. You can grab a seat because... I am going to take you on a little bit of a walk. All that talk about flowers. I want to see some of the flowers that are here in the meadow way. So I'm going to turn my camera around and you can see what I'm seeing as we walk through the meadow way. So I'm going to walk a little fast because there's lots of things to see here. 
But the first plant I want to show you are ones that we can see all over the place in our lawns and our schoolyards, but are a really neat pollinator plant. And these are our clovers. Bees will love these because they're one of their favorite colors, these purple colors. And they have lots of yummy, yummy, sweet nectar in them as well. Another plant I wanted to show you is this big one here. So this big plant, you can see how tall it gets, is a cup plant. And I want, I'm gonna look at it. I want you to maybe guess why this plant would be called a cup plant. I'm gonna go a little closer. Hmm, why do I think this plant could be called a cup plant? Let me see if I can find any other examples. Do you see how the water pools by the stem underneath the leaves, right by the leaves? They hold water just like a cup plant. So these cup plants hold water and this water is an important source of water for our pollinators as well. So bees will come by and drink some water up and butterflies will come by and drink some water up. So our cup plant is really important for that. But our cup plant is also important because Remember those bees that I mentioned that um, really love living in little holes? Well, our cup plant, once they're all dead and done growing, they have a pithy stem, which means they have a stem that has a hole in the middle that a lot of bees can use for their home. Do you all think that there's a bee living in this one maybe? Hmm, let's check the other side. Well, maybe not on the other side, but maybe in here. This could definitely be used by a bee. Really neat. All right, let's see what else we can find here. As I walk through, we can see that there's not too much blooming right now. It's still early in the season. I see some fleabane, and actually, this is going to be really hard to see. But as I go closer to this fleabane, there's a tiny fly. There we go that is drinking the nectar from the middle of this plant. So it is going to pollinate this plant as it, as it moves around um, because it is drinking the nectar and getting some pollen on its little furs. And this kind of fly actually looks sort of like a bee and it's called a flower fly. They mimic or look like bees, which is kind of cool as well. Let's keep looking. More clover, more fleabane, even more cup plant. We didn't have lots of water because it was raining earlier today. And we've made it to a nice big patch of milkweed. This is our milkweed that we were just talking about. And there's actually a closer one just over here that I'm going to look at. And these milkweed are just starting to get their flowers on them, which will be an important pollen and nectar source. And these leaves, I didn't see any on them yet, but these leaves will be an important spot for monarchs to lay their eggs just underneath the leaves. One last plant I want to show you that I love that's flowering in this meadow are these ones. Oh, so, so, so beautiful. These are wild lupin. And these wild lupin, these are actually the host plant. Remember that butterfly that I said is now extinct in Ontario? Um, those butterfly, the Connor blue, their host plant is this wild lupin, but there wasn't, there's hardly any wild lupin left in the wild in Ontario. So this plant was planted here in the meadowway, but excitingly, it's seeded by itself. And if you look into the field, maybe this one's a little closer, you can see some lupin starting to grow all by itself in the field, which is so, so exciting. Our lupin have really interesting flowers. So it's kind of hard to get into them because they're all closed up. They're like little purses almost. But if you sort of squeeze them open, you can sort of see what the inside of the flower looks like. And even where the pollen is, do you see that little yellow part? That's where the pollen is, which is really neat. You can see what their seeds look like as well. So these, um, oh look, here's a bee pollinating a lupin. Whoa, look at that bumblebee, you go ahead. Wow, so beautiful. And you can see how fast pollinators work. This bee is making quick work, finding lots of nectar and pollen. And if I were to even get a little closer, it's moving so fast, but there's actually pollen on its legs that I'm able to see. Can you 
see them. I can sort of see it on the camera. And you can see how the bee uses its legs to pull open the flower so that it can get into the nectar and the pollen. So, so, so neat. Thanks for making a visit, Bumblebee. See you later. So you can see some on the uh, these seeds. These flowers were already pollinated and this plant was able to make seeds so it can make even more lupin in this area. That was so special that we were able to see a bumblebee in real life pollinating our lupin in the meadowway. Now, you can see how huge the space is. So, so big. And I wish I knew more about it because I'm sure this space is so beautiful when all the flowers start blooming. There's so many birds flying around. I really wish I knew more about it. Maybe there's a sign around here that I could look at or, oh. Oh, hi, Janelle. Right, what are you doing here? I'm just exploring the meadow way with my magnifying glass oh. looking for little insects and other creatures out here. That's, uh, you know what? I was just wondering more about the meadow way and I know that you know a whole lot about the meadow way. So I'm so happy that I bumped into you. I would love to share about the meadow way. I have to put my books down. So I brought along, I was reading about how we're trying to protect pollinators in Toronto and areas around Toronto. And then I was looking up, I have two books, one about bees and one about butterflies. So I could actually look up what kinds of bees and butterflies I'm seeing today. I'm seeing more bees than butterflies right now. I think butterflies come out later. But to share about the meadow way with you, I actually had this. I didn't realize I had it with me, but I have a picture of what it used to look like. Check this out. So this picture is of what it used to look like. And if you look up, we can see all these lines, these hydro lines. Well, these hydro lines go really, really far in one direction and really, really far in another direction. And underneath them, it's usually grass, plain old turf grass, we call it. We are turning all of that into this. This is our after picture. And so part of it we've already finished and part of it we're still working on. But I'm so glad you asked Janelle. I actually wanted to give you an idea of where we are right now. I was kind of trying to check it out for myself. And I brought along a map and I can show you, I know that we're a little bit over time here, but I can show you my Metaway map. So the Metaway, and I believe that in the chat, there's actually a pinned um, email or it's not an email, a website for it, but you can see here's the Don River. Maybe you know the Don Valley Parkway. And I can see in this picture, there's all these buildings and homes and schools. And this green part is the Metaway. So if we move along, there's Eglinton Avenue, and if we keep on going, we're passing Warden. And wow, this meadow way is very, very long. Maybe some of you who live by Scarborough might know Thompson Memorial Park. I know we have um, like Mount Royal is tuning in from Brampton. So you're pretty far from here. But maybe we have some schools that are a little bit closer and have heard of some of these places. Here we have Ellesmere. And as we keep on going, it goes all the way over to Rouge Park and near where the Toronto Zoo is. So let's back up and see this as a whole. The Meadowway is a very, very, very long project. And there's a pathway when it's all finished, there'll be a big bike path that goes all the way from one end to the other. Now, right now we are right here. So there's McCowan Road and down here is Lawrence and there's a butterfly. <laughs> and we are right here looking for critters. So thank you for letting me share about the meadow way with you. I'm just gonna come back over here. And I think Janelle, I'm gonna turn it back over to Janelle. Janelle yeah, I didn't know which you. way you wanted the camera facing. No, that's all good. Thank you so much, Raya, for sharing with me what this beautiful space is gonna look like, what its purpose is. It is so wonderful to know that this area is going to be all connected and an important part for our important habitat and home for all of our pollinators. Um, so we're almost at the end, but we spent a lot of time talking about pollinators and they're really cool. I love talking about pollinators, but why would we talk about pollinators? Like, why are they important? Why are they our pals? Why do we want to why do we want to, oh, that's a picture of the meadow way, what it looks like in the summer and throughout the fall. That's really beautiful. I love that. 
So why do we want to know more about pollinators? Well, pollinators are really important for plants. We know that. They need to pollinate plants so that plants can make more seeds and grow. But if that didn't happen, we wouldn't have places like our meadow way. We wouldn't have a lot of plants and flowers around our soil. All that stuff that holds um, our houses and everything else. It would be really poor quality because there wouldn't be enough plants to hold it in place. Our soil may move into our waters and it may make our waters really unhealthy as well. Plants do a really good job at taking up pollutants and toxins from our water as well. So those plants that pollinators are helping to pollinate make our ecosystems and our habitats and our spaces and our cities healthier. So we for sure need our pollinators to make sure all the space stays healthy for us, but for all the life around that uses it as well. Now, pollinators are also important for our food systems. Has anyone eaten a fruit or a vegetable today? I hope you have. Well, you can probably thank a pollinator for those fruits and those vegetables. We know that pollinators make seeds, but inside those fruits and vegetables, we can usually find some seeds. So that means that a pollinator had some um, role in the making of that fruit. So a lot of our apples, our strawberries, blueberries, pears, bananas, tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, all those things need pollinators in order to make it to our table so that we can eat it. And if you don't like fruits and vegetables, well, you can still find a lot of those ingredients in a lot of the food that you may like, like the tomato sauce on pizza or the tomatoes in ketchup or mustard or any of those things, all of those things need to be pollinated at some point to make those ingredients. So we needed to make sure that we are protecting our pollinators so that we can continue to have really healthy spaces, but we can also continue to be able to eat and feed our communities and feed ourselves so that our bodies are healthy as well. So, I really enjoyed learning about pollinators with you all. Thank you for all being here. Um, we are about to get into questions in a second. So if you have any burning questions about pollinators or about um, anything we learned about the meadow way or anything, you can pop them in the chat right now. Um, but we're, we're almost done. So we want to say thank you for joining us throughout our whole year of having nature in your classroom live streams. It's our last one for the year. And we're really happy that you're here sharing it with us. We will be back in the fall uh, to have some more live streams to explore different places with you and learn about different topics. So we hope you can join us again in the fall as we boot back up and learn more about our nature. So with that, I will open it up to questions. And Raya is gonna be here helping me with them. Are yes. there any questions, Raya? I just joined the live stream and um, I wanted to see if there were any questions. There aren't any in the chat right now, but I'm wondering, Janelle, do you have a favorite pollinator? Ooh, that's a good question. I really love um, the native solitary bees, that agopostamon, that, that green and yellow striped bee. I love those bees. I think they're so, so beautiful. They are beautiful. I know the ones you mean. Yeah. They're so tiny, they're too. So little, they're so, so tiny. little. How about you? Do you have a favorite pollinator? Um, I, hmm, I know I asked the question and I hadn't thought about if I had one. I really like that bee, too. I just call it a sweat bee because I know it's a mm. type of sweat bee. But you know who else I really like? I like the leaf cutter bees. Ooh. Leaf cutter bees cut perfect circles out of leaves to line their tunnel, their nest, so they can um, their babies have a healthy place to be. And so they're one of my favorite pollinators. I love those too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No questions to come in. All right. So well, <laughs> thanks, Raya. <laughs> well, with that. Um, we're always happy to ask, answer any questions. Feel free to reach out to um, the education team at the Toronto and Region Conservation um, Authority. And we're happy that you're able to join us today. So with that, we will say a great good, big goodbye. Have a great summer. Go out, find some pollinators. And when you see a pollinator, make sure you thank them for all the hard work that they do. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>